Good afternoon. Um, I'm Sanjeev Goel. I'm the chair of the economics faculty, and uh, um, it's my great pleasure to uh, welcome Professor Raghuram Rajan from, as the Marshall Lecturer of, for this year, 2015-16. Um, Raghuram Rajan is the current governor of the Reserve Bank of India, and he's on leave uh, from his position as the Eric Glacier Distinguished Service Professor of Finance at the University of Chicago. Professor Rajan spans the world of high academia, central banking, and international finance. In each of these worlds, his achievements have been truly outstanding. Professor Rajan had his early education in India at the Indian Institute of Technology in Delhi and the Indian Institute of Management at Ahmedabad. He received his PhD from MIT in 1991 and has been on the faculty of the Booth School at Chicago since then. In 2003, he was the inaugural winner of the Fisher Black Prize, given every two years by the American Finance Association to the financial economist younger than 40 who has made the most significant contribution to the theory and practice of finance. This is in 2003. Uh, the citation for the prize says, and I quote, with over 50 papers and articles um, and a forthcoming book, there is almost no facet of finance that Rajan's work does not touch. In the years since, Professor Rajan has taken on a much more public, uh, his work has taken on a much more public um, uh, sort of influence, public image, and in particular, I would like to talk about two of his books which are very influential. Uh, the, first, the first book, Saving Capitalism from the Capitalists, written jointly with Luigi Zingales, um, explores the tension between free markets um, and uh, capture of government by vested interests and the role of democratic politics. In a subsequent book, um, Fault Lines, How Hidden Fractures Still Threaten the World Economy, uh, this argument and a general engagement uh, with larger themes of economic finance and politics are developed in a very powerful general argument that the 2007-2008 financial crisis arose out of political and policy choices um, in response to rising inequality in the United States. It won the Financial Times Goldman Sachs Business Book of the Year Award in 2010 and has really brought Professor Rajan very much into uh, the public sphere and has been the subject of a great deal of debate uh, since then. A distinguishing feature of economics in Cambridge uh, throughout a long history has been an engagement with practical economic questions. Our best economists have proposed theories that have transformed the way the subject works, the way we think, but they have not remained ivory economists, they have not remained ivory tower academics, they have also been deeply involved with the design of economic policy. It would be difficult to find a contemporary economist who reflects this Cambridge tradition better than Professor Rajan. It is a great pleasure for me to present the 2016 Marshall Lecturer, Professor Rajan, to you. Thank you very much. Sir. Thank you very much, Sanjeev. Can you hear me back there? OK, so good evening. And uh, what I want to do in the next hour uh, or 55 minutes is uh, talk about this topic, why banks? And um, I'll come to the, uh, the, the, the sort of underlying rationale for why this is important today. But I also want to talk about uh, what we do with theory. Uh, given that many of you are undergrads, some of whom may be persuaded to do PhDs, uh, what uh, this kind of theory, the kind of theory I'm going to present, uh, I call it matchstick theory. It's, it's sort of matchstick men drawn 
uh, stripped of all their clothing, stripped of all the paraphernalia. And the idea is to see in a stripped down model uh, where we say these things resemble the real world, can we get uh, certain results? And do those results then inform us about the real world, OK? And um, of course, you will say, this is a matchstick model. The banks in your model don't resemble the banks in the real world. There are no subprime mortgage-backed securities in this model. Uh, the fancy stuff is not here. But I think when you, when you un understand the underlying factors in this model that are at work, perhaps we can go back to get some understanding of what the real world is like. And that's uh, when, when people criticize economic theory, and some of you have obviously are well, well versed in it, uh, often the criticism is, this doesn't look like the real world. And, and uh, the point is, the real world is very complicated. But we're trying to isolate the, the key dimensions at work here. And we're trying to see, in this very, very uh, matchstick-like model, can we get action that tells us something more? And if so, that can be very powerful in explaining how the real world works. So here is a bank in my model. A bank is, has illiquid assets, illiquid financial assets, loans that cannot be sold at a moment's notice. But you can also talk about subprime, uh, the junior tranches of subprime mortgage-backed securities. And this is unlike money market mutual funds, which have very liquid assets. So bank typically has illiquid assets that cannot be sold on the market uh, and for full value in, sh in the short run. And the bank is funded by demandable liabilities, people who can take their money at a moment's notice, who can go to their bank branch and say, I want to be repaid today. And this is unlike finance companies, which uh, basically make, make long-term loans, illiquid loans just like banks but are financed with long-term funding rather than short-term funding. Venture capitalists, for example, uh, is funded with long-term funding, uh, has a fund which has to be repaid five or eight years down the line, rather than uh, a demandable uh, um, deposit. Now, this combination makes banks prone to runs, because the asset side cannot be realized very quickly, the liability side demands liquidity instantaneously, and the two uh, don't necessarily gel together. And, and therefore, this, this raises a, a question. Why is it that we have this kind of structure? Now, you know, today people say this is because there's a tax advantage due to debt. That's a silly explanation. Why? Because what we're talking about is short-term debt, short-term liabilities. But all liabilities which are debt-like are tax advantaged relative to equities. So this doesn't explain why it's short-term liabilities which play such a big part. Some people argue it's deposit insurance which makes these banks so prevalent. It's because deposit insurance is underpriced, therefore you get a ton of banks. Turns out that banks used to be present in 12th century Italy where there was no deposit insurance. They used to be in 19th century United States, where they used to fail like flies. There was no deposit insurance. So this structure has been around for a long time. <coughs> Too big to fail. That's another recent explanation post-crisis. They're betting on the fact that the government will bail them out. Perhaps, but banks existed when they were too small to worry about, and that structure was, was still around at that time, when they were not systemic. Right? So, so the question is, is there an efficiency property to the structure which makes it a, 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 a kind of device which is worth thinking about? And that will allow us to discuss the trade-offs better. Once we ask ourselves, do we need banks, then we can answer the question, what is the cost of abolishing banks? After every crisis, we have somebody saying, Let's get rid of banks. Let's do narrow banking. I think in the, United, in the United Kingdom also, you have a version of that, not as dramatic. But it is, why don't we fund, um, um, uh, if we're taking demand deposits, let's fund liquid loans, liquid assets with that. Let us not fund illiquid assets. Let us ring fence the deposits in a structure. That kind of solution 
comes up every time there's a serious crisis. In the 1940s, it was Henry Simmons and his narrow banking proposal in the United States keeps coming back. So to answer the question, why don't we go towards narrow banks and get rid of banks, we have to ask ourselves, why do we have banks in the first place? What efficiency do they bring? Second, post-financial crisis, we have all these arguments about raising bank capital. There seems to be sometimes no limit to which some people want banks to raise capital. Essentially, the more capital banks have, the less they depend on demand deposits, right? And so the question is, if this is in fact the way we want to go, again we've got to ask ourselves, is there any efficiency uh, associated with demand deposits that we're killing by asking for more and more capital to be. What are the consequences of higher and higher capital requirements other than getting back on the bankers, those, those rascals who made so much money in the crisis, but, uh, but other than that, other than uh, revenge, is there a reason to raise bank capital and what are the consequences, okay? So, uh, the, bottom, uh, the bottom line for this kind of research is we're trying to provide some rationale for how we then think about regulation, crises, this, that. Uh, so the first thing we need to ask is why do we have banks? A bunch of papers this is based on largely, I mean it's all work done with Doug Diamond who uh, many ways one could uh, argue is the father of modern banking so I'm his sidekick in all this. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's interesting uh, work working with him. Uh, setup. Here's the basic setup. And I want to walk you through the basic idea before I go into details, because I don't want you to get lost in the details. There's a project. Uh, and we have an entrepreneur who can do the project. He, this, this is the entrepreneur's idea. The entrepreneur is the only guy who can do the project. That specificity will become important in a second. Then we have a financier who can finance the entrepreneur, and the financier may have some money of his own, but largely he's going to raise it from investors. So this is the traditional picture of, of financing, of intermediated financing. The financier is taking money from people, passing it on to the entrepreneur, and the entrepreneur goes out and does projects. The entrepreneur is the only one who can do the project. There's also some specificity we will mandate from the financier to the entrepreneur coming in a second. Okay, so what is the basic idea? It stems from two factors. One, that um, human capital um, is specific, okay? Uh, that's, a, that's a long winded way of saying only the entrepreneur can do the project, make that assumption. The entrepreneur has an idea, it can't be easily displaced. You can't get a guy off the street to undertake the project because he doesn't have the same skills as the entrepreneur, that's one. Second, the financier also, once he lends to the project, develops specific skills, understands where the problems are in the project, what to monitor, what not to monitor. There is a relationship built. We're talking about relationship loans, a relationship between the banker, uh, the financier, and the entrepreneur, okay? So there are two levels of human capital, entrepreneur relative to the project, financial relative to the entrepreneur, okay? And the key uh, problem or the key uh, uh, weakness in this process is of commitment. Now, uh, those of you who've studied the work of Hart and Moore understand that this is based on, on their work. And the idea basically is in the modern day, it's very hard to commit your human capital to anything. We don't have uh, slavery anymore, you can't sell your, uh, your body and soul to somebody else, uh, you can always walk away. You can always walk away from any enterprise. That is the friction in this model which creates a certain amount of action, okay? So uh, again, this, as I said, this is a matchstick theory. This is a matchstick assumption. And we can ask later on, you know, are other assumptions equally uh, viable to get the kind of result. Basic idea is if uh, that there are people with specific skills, the only problem is they can't commit their specific skills uh, to anybody. They can't sign a contract saying under any circumstance uh, I will continue working on this project or I will continue monitoring this project if, if it's the financial, they can always walk away. So in this process, the financial cannot trust 
that the entrepreneur will stick to the project and will not threaten to walk away or try to renegotiate the loan down. That's one level of problem. Uh, but the same problem occurs with the financial, that investors cannot trust the financial to not walk away from the project and say, I'm not going to monitor this entrepreneur anymore. I'm not going to collect from this entrepreneur. So the same problem is at two levels. Well, what we show is, I mean, this is, this is not anything we do specifically. Uh, debt, a debt contract commits the entrepreneur to pay the financial. You'll see that for reasons. This is just revisiting Hart and Moore. But what is uh, perhaps more important is that demandable debt commits the financial to repay arm's length investors. Okay? And this becomes critical because without it, there would really be no role for intermediation. And with this, demandable debt commits the financial to pay these arm's length investors. It is what creates liquidity for the project. It is what enables the bank to offer demand deposits and also service the demand deposits because, in effect, the banker is committing to stay on course and manage the money for investors. Okay? So uh, what is important in this, in this structure is that demandable debt will commit the financial. Now, one last question you have to ask when you see the structure, and that's, that's where this model has bite, is why doesn't the demandable debt work when it's placed on the entrepreneur? Why can't investors directly put their money in the entrepreneur? Why do they have to put it via the financial? And that's what I will try and explain as we go through why the intermediary is essential in this process and why disintermediation doesn't uh, really work that well. So that's where we're going. Uh, uh, just be, OK, there's, there's this. Why is the slide missing here? OK, there's, there's a slide missing. I'll just walk, talk you through this slide. Um, we have an entrepreneur who essentially needs to, uh, to borrow money for a project. Let's say he needs to borrow one pound. The project lasts for two periods. It's a long-dated project. And uh, the pound has to be invested initially when the project is starting off. It returns a cash flow. All we need to focus on right now is the cash flow. It returns at the end. It returns let us say C2, C um, subscript 2 at day 2. Okay? That cash flow is returned only if the entrepreneur sticks to the project throughout. If he stays and applies his human capital in managing the project, if he walks away, that cash flow is not produced. Now, in investing in the project, it creates collateral assets, assets that have collateral value that can be redeployed elsewhere. Now, the financier knows that the entrepreneur can walk away, but the financier, if the entrepreneur walks away or before the entrepreneur walks away, can grab the assets and sell them to somebody else for value x2. Okay, so c2 is the cash flows produced at the end, x2 is the collateral value of the assets, and typically for a project to be viable, the cash flows that are produced over time have to be higher than the collateral value which tends to be lower than the uh, cash flows over time. And, and so, as I said, the key friction is that any time after borrowing and investing, the entrepreneur can threaten to quit before cash flows are due to be produced um, and uh, unless the terms of the financing are renegotiated. Okay? So, here's how the renegotiation works. And, and again, uh, for those of you who are familiar with Hart and Moore, we'll see that it's, it's that structure. So let's say before day two, the entrepreneur has promised to pay uh, P2. That's the amount he's promised to pay against the debt. Now, the entrepreneur has the ability, because he owns his own human capital, hasn't pledged it to create the cash flows. He has the ability to go to the financial and say, look, I'm tired of this project. I'm going to walk. I'm going to walk unless you bring down the payment that I have to make, down from P2 to something that I think is more sensible, right? Um, he can threaten that, and we'll talk about what happens after that in a second, or he can make the payment and then produce the cash flows. If he makes the payment P2, he produces the cash flow C2, out of that he makes the payment, so he keeps C2 minus P2 while the financial gets P2, okay? 
Again, matchstick model, simple. We're going to walk through this. Now, supposing he says, let us renegotiate. I'm, I'm sick of this project. I can be tempted to stay, but only if you renegotiate the payment down. Well, in that case, the financier can do one of two things. He can either liquidate the project for X2 and say, look, I don't trust you anymore. You've, uh, you've, you've, this is the last straw. I'm going to liquidate. He'll get X, uh, the financial will take away X2. X2, uh, assume for the moment to avoid complication, that is less than P2. So the financial is not as well off as if he got paid, but gets a substantial amount of money back. Alternatively, they could enter into a bargaining game. Uh, and let's, for the sake of convenience, give all the bargaining power in the bargaining game to the entrepreneur. So if they enter into the bargaining game, the entrepreneur keeps C2. Okay? This is an alternating offer bargaining game. I don't want to go into the details. Basically, uh, let's assume all the bargaining power is with the entrepreneur. So if the financial lets the entrepreneur get into the bargaining game, the entrepreneur uh, can bargain him down. The entrepreneur will keep C2. So what's the outcome in this kind of model? If the entrepreneur tries to renegotiate P2 down, knowing that once they get into that uh, alternating offer bargaining game, the, the financial will get nothing, he liquidates immediately. Okay, so he gets X2 if the entrepreneur tries to negotiate down. Which means that the entrepreneur knows that at the minimum he has to pay X2, and he won't pay anything more than that, so he will offer to pay X2 to the financial, and that's what the financial will, uh, will, uh, will accept. So the entrepreneur will renegotiate if he faces debt which is higher than the collateral value. Essentially what this says is collateral is important, that debt is usually negotiated down to the collateral value of assets, uh, provided we have the assumptions about bargaining. Th those aren't critical to the model, but it's, uh, it's, it's what makes it very simple to discuss. Okay, so what you see immediately is the consequences of illiquidity. The entrepreneur can produce C2 in cash flows. This is the cash flow that the project can produce, but he can't borrow more than X2, which is less than C2. Why? Because he cannot pledge the full value of the cash flows to the financial, because he has bargaining power. Because the, he's the only guy who can manage the project, even though he can produce C2, he can pledge only X2. Okay? So the project is illiquid. And it is possible that if X2 is less than 1, remember, he's, he needs 1 to start the project. Even if C2 is infinity, even if C2 is infinity or you know, 1,000, the project will not get off the ground because the only collateral the financial has is of liquidating the project. If X2 is less than 1, he doesn't have enough bargaining power over the project. Okay? So that's why the real project is illiquid. Okay? Now, um, the financier can liquidate for X2 because he knows where the bones are buried in the project. He knows the industry very well. He knows who the potential buyers are. He take, can take the assets and find that second best user in the industry. Okay? That's why the financier has capabilities. Um, the ordinary investor, the guy in the market, the, the depositor, doesn't have any of these capabilities. He doesn't know what the industry is. He doesn't know how to make a business loan. He doesn't know how to shake the borrower's hand and look at his business plans. He has none of these capabilities. So let us assume investors are less skilled in lending and can liquidate only for beta x2 where beta is less than 1. So you can assume beta is close to 0. I, I, I don't know anything about this. If you don't, are not there to get the money from the entrepreneur, I can actually generate nothing. Uh, I can collect nothing from the entrepreneur. Okay? Let's assume he can collect a little bit. Uh, beta is not 0, but just it's, it's small. So what this implies is following the same logic as earlier, while the entrepreneur can raise x2 from the financier, the financier can only raise beta x2 from those depositors. Okay? So this creates another layer of illiquidity. Because the depositors or the investors, let, let me call them investors for a little while, investors have only the ability to extract beta x2 
by taking the asset away from the financial and liquidating it, and that creates a second layer of liquidity. So if the, um, um, if the entrepreneur were to borrow directly from these investors, he could only borrow beta x2, which is a very small amount. Okay? Now, it might seem that this gives you a rationale for intermediation. The intermediary can come in between, and he can extract x2 from the entrepreneur. But unless he has his own money at work, he can't borrow more than beta x2 from the investor. So effectively, unless he puts his own money to work, the, um, the intermediary is useless. But let's assume the intermediary has some money, money and can put some money to work also. There's another problem which comes up, and I want to, I want to uh, uh, put that uh, uh, up here, which is complicating the model a little more. Let's say the intermediary has the money to put and invest in this illiquid project. However, the intermediary halfway through at date one suddenly discovers that he has a fantastic investment opportunity, much better in terms of returns. It produces R greater than one, uh, which uh, is fantastic, much bigger than X2 uh, if he invests in that. But he's already locked in. He's already locked in in investing in the entrepreneurs. So if he gets this wonderful new investment opportunity, he has a problem. Uh, he has a foregone opportunity, an opportunity loss. And if the financial knows that he can get such opportunities, he is going to demand an illiquidity premium from the entrepreneur for lending to the entrepreneur. Why? Because if he had his one pound with him up front, and he faced this investment opportunity without being locked in, without being invested in the entrepreneur up front, he could invest in this wonderful new investment opportunity and get a high return. So even if the financier has some money, there still is a problem, which is that he gets locked in into this illiquid project because nobody else can take it over from him. Okay? And so he can't extract any money from that project until it matures or he liquidates. What will happen in this case is he will be tempted to liquidate the project when he gets this wonderful return, but this can be socially suboptimal. It may be better that the entrepreneur produce the cash flows at the end because C2 is very high, except that the uh, financier might say, you're getting C2, but that's going to you. All I get is X2. Instead, let me liquidate you, take the money, and invest in this high return project. Okay? So that's the cost of illiquidity. What that tells us is it would be better if the financier had some way of committing his human capital to these large number of investors such that he could raise X2 from the investors rather than extricate it from the entrepreneur. So the entrepreneur continues with his project. If the financier has a wonderful new opportunity, he just borrows some more from the investors and invests it in the opportunity without getting out of the, uh, the money that he's put in. But for that, he needs to commit to the investors that he will collect that money from the entrepreneur and pay it back to the investors, right? He needs to commit his human capital. That's essential. Otherwise, you face the cost of illiquidity. And of course, in the first case where he had no money to begin with, there would be another problem, which is he couldn't raise much money from the investors in the market and wouldn't be able to finance the project in the first place. So, in both cases, one when he has no money, and second where he has money and has an opportunity which shows up, in both cases it would be better if he could commit to pay. Okay? So um, the point, however, is how do you ensure this? How do you ensure that he pays uh, investors the full amount promised, X2, rather than beta X2, which is what they can extract through bargaining power? And this is where we argue that the way to do this is through a demandable deposit structure. And what the demandable deposit structure does is 
it essentially creates a collective action problem in which all the depositors run for their money as soon as they hear the banker wants to renegotiate their debt down. As they run for their money, essentially they will impose some discipline on the banker, which means then he will not even bother to ask them to re uh, restructure payments to reduce the level of their deposits. He will pay them as and when they, they are due. So once he can commit to paying the deposits in full, it solves the problem. It solves the problem because on the one hand, he can raise the full amount of money that depositors get. He has no commitment problem. He has committed to pass on what he gets from the entrepreneur directly to depositors. That's number one. And second, if he ever has a liquidity need, rather than liquidating the entrepreneur, he borrows more from the depositors because now he can commit to paying them with this deposit structure. Okay? Uh, similarly, if any depositor wants money, no project is liquidated by the uh, financier, by the, by the bank. Instead, he issues money to another depositor. He issues a deposit to another depositor, takes the money from him, and pays this guy. So essentially, the bank becomes a, 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 a source of liquidity, provides liquidity to the depositors, protects the entrepreneurs from liquidation, and ensures both sides are happy. And it all comes from the fact that demand deposits allow the banker to commit. So the question you have to ask is, how do the demand depositors, uh, how do demand deposits allow the bank to commit? So what, what we have right here is this structure now. There's the entrepreneur who has been lent to by the bank. The bank can collect X2. Depositors can only get beta X2. And uh, the question is, how can the bank commit to paying the full X2 to the depositor? Now, in any situation where if the bank tries to renegotiate the X2 down, a ton of bricks descends on the banker and finishes him, he would never do it. He would never try and renegotiate, right? That would allow him to commit to paying X2. Well, think of the demand deposits as being that kind of structure, that as soon as he tries to ne negotiate, they fall like a ton of bricks on him and take away his assets. Uh, and they do it for a reason, which I'll talk about in a second. And as a result, he's disciplined. Now, this is where the model becomes a little uh, um, detailed because a theorist will have some important questions which I need to answer in a second, which I'll do uh, as we go through it. But bear with me. This is the idea we're going to, if I try to renegotiate my deposits, I suffer a huge penalty, and therefore I commit to paying them because I commit to paying them, because demand deposits are such credible instruments, they become a source of liquidity. If I want to pay um, A, I just raise deposits from B and pay A as a result, OK? So, so if the banker threatens to renegotiate, what happens? Well, uh, the de demand deposit contract is such that at any point I can ask for cash or an equivalent value of assets. But how much I get depends on my position in the line. If I've queued up in front of the bank and I'm right up ahead, I get more than if I'm at the back of the line, because there may be nothing left. That's the standard bank run, right? The guys at the front of the line get to take their cash out. When the cash runs out, the banker shuts the bank and says there's nothing more. Now, what this does is that um, it means because the market value of the assets in the bank, if they were sold in the market, remember the bank has a project loan worth x2 in the hands of the banker, worth only beta x2 in the market, because that's what the average market investor can collect on that. So the value of the assets in the bank is only beta x2, less than the value that has been promised to depositors, assuming depositors have been promised x2. Okay? The bank is a complete pass-through. It's promising everything. Depositors are, are promised x2. When they come to the bank, essentially, they will run the bank. They will take away all the assets, because there are not enough assets in the bank for the value of deposits that have been promised. Okay? Let me stop a second here. And I'm told I'm not supposed to ask questions. 
uh, uh, to answer questions, but does a anybody have a question at this point on this mechanism? Is it, is it reasonably clear? This is important, okay? So, um, now, um, okay, well, I've moved forward. Um, anyone who stays and doesn't run on the bank essentially gets nothing because everybody else is ahead in the line and has taken away the value. So as soon as the banker threatens to renegotiate the deposits down, it makes sense for everyone who hears this to run to the bank to take out the money. Okay? Because the first guy there gets it in full, the last guy gets nothing. Okay? So that is pretty standard with a bank run. Uh, any call to renegotiate will disintermediate the banker. But there's still one more question to answer, which is what the bank run does is takes away assets from the bank and puts it in the hands of the depositors. Okay? Why can't the banker go to the depositors at this point and say, look, okay, I made a mistake. I, I tried to renegotiate you down. You did the right thing by penalizing me and taking away my loans. But why don't we talk, right? Uh, after all, you have the loan. Uh, you have the claim on the entrepreneur, but you can extract only beta x2, very small amount. I will work for you. I will get x2 from the, uh, from the, um, uh, from the entrepreneur. Trust me, this time I will behave. And I will get you the full value of the money. Why don't you bring me back into the picture, right? And um, so it's no guarantee that the banker will not attempt to renegotiate at this point. Well. It turns out that, uh, you know, given the structure of the model right now, the banker essentially will be totally disintermediated. The depositors will not go back to the uh, banker because today the depositors have the loan. The entrepreneur will approach the depositors and say, hey, you know, there's a banker sitting out there wanting to work on your behalf, but he's disintermediated. All he can do is collect from me to give to you. He's not going to add any value to this process. He's just a transfer agent. So tell me what he's promised to give you and the cost iron guarantees he's given you uh, about how much he'll pay you. I'll pay you that amount. I'll pay you that amount, forget him, cut him out of the business. Okay? The point is that the disintermediation process created by a bank run changes the ownership of the loan. The ownership of the loan is now in the hands of the depositors and they have the ability to decide whether to rehire the banker or just leave him out. And since the entrepreneur can make them offers which pay them anything that the banker will pay, essentially they'll ac accept the entrepreneur's offer. The point is, there is no value addition right now. It is only um, value transfer. The banker's adding nothing. He added value up front when he made the loan because he had special skills, etc. But once the loan is made, once it's monitored, et cetera, et cetera, he adds nothing to the process. He's just an intermediary changing uh, uh, you know, where the rents go, and he can be cut out totally. There is no loss in efficiency if he's cut out, and in effect, the side deal can be done with the entrepreneur and the depositors. This is the part of the model with the matchstick part, which you may wonder, what does this really represent in the real world? Okay? It's, it's important uh, to get the sense there's completion here, and I'll tell you why it's important in the, in, in, the, in the larger framework, but it hangs together theoretically. Why, in fact, disintermediation can extract all the rents from the banker, which is why he will not start the process of di disintermediation by asking to renegotiate. So it's collective action problem plus the fact that he can be cut out of the rents, which uh, which is key to the, this point. Um, so disintermediation kills the banker's rents even though he has not lost his skills. And that's because he's only a, sh a shadow at this point. He's outside saying, I'll, I'll use my skills on your behalf. But all you need is the possibility that he'll use skills on the behalf of depositors. They can do a side deal with the entrepreneur without actually using him. His rents get cut, cut out. And therefore, the banker will not call for renegotiation. And essentially, what that means is he can pay the full X2 to the depositors, okay? 
This is important because this then gives us a sense of why these banks exist. Up front, they have the skills to make the loan. Exposed, they're disciplined by the threat of a bank run. And that discipline is effective because it can cut the bank out of, out of the rents. Now, to see why this is important, uh, think about what, what happens with the firms. Can you use a similar mechanism with the entrepreneur directly? Why do you need the bank at all? Why can't investors have demand deposits against the entrepreneur? And the answer is the entrepreneur is still critical to the value addition process right through. Remember, he produces the cash flow C2. Without him, cash flows would go down to X2. So he is needed right till the end. He can't be cut out. He's not just a pure intermediary transferring value. He's actually adding value. And therefore, there is a big difference between uh, uh, ba uh, banks, which are intermediaries, and entrepreneurs, which are creating value, because the entrepreneur will not get disintermediated. His rents will not go down through demand deposits. Because ultimately, let's say there's a run on the entrepreneur. Uh, the depositors own the firm now. The entrepreneur will go to the depositors and say, look, you need me. Because without me, we can't create value C2. Uh, and, and therefore, let us talk. So, so that, I think, is, is, uh, is, is essential uh, to, this, to this discussion. Uh, the point is that bank runs essentially kill the banker's rents. Firm runs don't kill the entrepreneur's rents because he still is contributing value to the process. He still continues to add value to the process. And therefore, he cannot be shut out of the renegotiation. So what is the bottom line of this kind of framework? The bottom line is that the fragile capital structure, the demand deposit-led capital structure, is really a way to liquefy the illiquid assets. Yes, you have illiquid assets, but you can borrow a greater fraction of the value of those illiquid assets because you have the banker able to promise more of the value to the investors, to the demand depositors. And what that means is also you can provide liquidity when needed. The bank, when it has a demand depositor coming for his money, it can borrow from another depositor and pay. Neither depositor need to have any skills. All they need to know is we can run any time this guy tries to bargain us down. That's a very powerful disciplinary, disciplinary device, which then forces him to pay us our full value. There's never going to be a situation he's going to say, come take uh, less. Okay. Um, now, um, again, what I want to say is this is more than the work that Calamaris and Khan have done, where uh, demand deposit runs are a way of preventing a crime that is in process. For those of you who know that paper, uh, this is about how uh, that, that process would work even for firms. If, if the firm is doing something fishy, depositors can run on the firm and prevent a crime in, uh, which is in process because they can stop it in its tracks. This is not about stopping crimes in process. It is about committing human capital, committing human capital at, at, uh, uh, from the banker to the depositors. OK, so what has this got to do with the real world? Let's try and apply this a little more to real world stuff. Uh, venture capitalists. Why doesn't the venture capitalist issue demand deposits? Well, the venture capitalist is adding value all the time. He's trying to make that garage-based startup into a full-fledged firm. Uh, he or she is present every day offering managerial support, uh, trying to work with the entrepreneur, trying to bring professional managers in, offering advice, that it's not just about making the loan initially and collecting it exposed. It is much more hands-on than the typical banker. And given that, the venture capitalist cannot be cut out of this equation because he's needed. Just like the entrepreneur is needed exposed, the venture capitalist is also needed exposed, cannot be cut out of the equation. And therefore, demand deposits will not discipline the venture capitalist. Venture capitalist is better off uh, raising money long term because the demand deposits are ineffective. What about money market mutual funds? Okay. Um, now, in money market mutual funds, 
what happens is the fund is marked every day down to the value of the assets, the market value of the assets. Because the fund is marked down to the market value of the assets, any investor knows what he or she can get. So, you know, before this paper was written before Prime Securities, which, which had a run, uh, but that was because uh, the, the assets were being marked to stale values, and there was some value to run. But typically, money market assets which are marked to market and uh, essentially don't try and maintain the buck, uh, don't try and uh, uh, keep a, a certain minimum value, they are immune to runs. Because every day you mark the value of the assets down to their fundamental intrinsic market value. Okay? Now, those kinds of funds don't create any liquidity. They don't add value to the market value of the funds. Unlike the bank, where the market value of the bank's illiquid assets were beta x2, what the investor can get by taking those assets to the market, but what the bank could generate with those, with those assets was x2, which was bigger than x2. So the bank, unlike the money market fund, by being subject to runs, actually adds value to the assets over and above what the money market fund can do. So the money market fund is entirely reliant on its assets being liquid and having a market value. If those assets were illiquid, it could not actually function particularly well. In fact, it would be problematic. The bank can function with illiquid assets because it adds value to those illiquid assets. Okay? So the bottom line of this, uh, this kind of analysis, before I go to capital, is banks create liquidity and reduce the risk that borrowers might be liquidated. They protect the, the, the entrepreneur from unreasonable demands for cash. They allow the entrepreneur to actually run the whole project, even though he is borrowed from the bank. And the way they do this is by being able to pledge greater value. By being able to pledge greater value, they are also able to borrow more and therefore meet anybody on the depositor's side need for immediacy. So that's why you can find long-term projects with short-term depositors, each of whom may, may need liquidity at a moment's notice. And that's because the bank can, roll, uh, can borrow from somebody else to pay the guys who need the money. Um, the bank provides a more reliable source of funding than markets, allows entrepreneurs to raise more funds at a lower li liquidity premium. Uh, if the uh, entrepreneur borrowed directly from the markets, he could only raise beta x2 the bank can lend him X2, which is much more. Okay? Uh, equivalently, this means a lower cost of capital. And uh, what this also implies, and this is where I want to talk a little bit about a, a different paper in the, in the small amount of time available, that asking the bank to replace its deposits with longer term financing like capital will certainly make the bank less risky and I'll come to that in, in, the, in, the next, uh, in the next slide, but will also come at a cost. That is, there will be more rents absorbed by the banker, there will be a costlier intermediation process, the cost of capital that is transmitted to firms will be higher. And therefore, borrowing will become more difficult if you ask the banks to raise more capital. OK, so this is, uh, is a nice segue into the second paper I want to talk a little bit about, and then uh, I think we're, we're out of time, uh, which is, OK, I've made this grand theory based on demand deposits which are runnable. But of course, we know that the model that I offered you was a model of certainty. Nothing, there's no uncertainty. The asset values were known up front. I know how much to borrow. All I have to do is pledge what I've borrowed. As soon as you have uncertainty, there's a downside to demand deposits, which is if the asset values, uh, if the loan uh, that I've made turns out to be risky and not pay as much because the world is different as was originally promised, I have a problem because I can't go to my depositors and say, look, look, I'm not trying to renegotiate because I'm, I'm trying to get a better deal from you. I need to renegotiate because you know, the world has become much, much worse than I thought initially. Assets don't have much value. Let us talk. They're going to say, well, I heard that story before, and they're all going to run again. Okay?
because they don't know which one is which. In fact, they're, they're programmed to run. That, that's the whole point about demand deposits. Even when I genuinely have difficulties on the asset side, I will face a run. So uh, this immediately implies that we'll have a solvency problem. A bank which is funded only by demand deposits is going to go bust a lot of the time. It's going to go bust not because the banker is trying to renegotiate deposits, but because there's nothing to absorb risk in the bank's capital structure. We'll get too much uh, project liquidation, offset a little bit by the greater commitment, but there's a trade-off here. And, and so what we need is to buffer deposits with softer, potentially renegotiable claims such as bank capital. Now, given that it's late in the evening, I won't walk you through the gory details of bank capital. All I need you to take away is that unlike demand deposits which are runnable, longer term liabilities such as long term debt or capital uh, don't have as harsh properties as demand deposits. They don't run on a moment's notice. But it also means that I can negotiate with them and essentially the banker gets to retain some rents. Okay? So now you see the trade-off. On the one hand, when I issue more capital, it does buffer the bank from ups and downs in asset values. On the other hand, if I um, issue more capital, the discipline on the banker uh, is less. And so I can always go to the capital holders and say, look, look, I mean, my depositors are crazy guys. They just run for their money when I talk to them. But you guys understand me. Let's talk about how much I pay you. And maybe instead of taking a pound for what you've put in, why don't you take 50, cent, uh, 50 pence, OK? So that negotiation can take place. Now, of course, capital knows that this negotiation can take place and upfront charges for it. The bottom line is the more capital you put in, the more the uh, cost of raising money for the bank. So the trade-off is higher cost of raising money for the bank. The benefit is less liquidation of the project, a safer bank. And you have to weigh the two together. A completely safe bank with 100% capital would have a very high cost of financing because there's no discipline uh, exerted by demand deposits on the banker. Uh, on the other hand, a completely deposit-based bank would you know, crash every day because there's no buffer. And so we need to pick the amount of capital, keeping this in mind, a trade-off. Uh, uh, more capital means bank less risky, uh, but banker absorbs more rents. And this trade-off, uh, I'll, I'll skip the example. Uh, basically, uh, what this explains, uh, and uh, I urge you to read the papers if you're interested, maybe after your exams, but, uh, uh, you know, what this explains is why bank capital is costly. And it's not because you know, of an asymmetric information problem. It's not because of uh, uh, you know, some of the fans of more capital invoke Modigliani-Miller as if that's a new theorem. Uh, for those of you who uh, know of uh, you know, finance, Modigliani-Miller is the basic theorem in finance which says it doesn't matter whether you finance through debt or equity. Uh, the cost of capital doesn't change. It's based on some very specific assumptions. Uh, and if this is a matchstick model, that is matchstick plus plus. And the real world is uh, the kinds of uh, uh, issues that I've introduced here, the inability to commit human capital, take us away from that world. So in this world, capital is costly. And mandating more capital means the cost of finance to uh, small businesses, to firms increases. And uh, if you suddenly mandate a significant amount of capital uh, in a system which is coasting along on less capital, you could get essentially a capital-induced credit crunch. And we've had situations in the past where this has happened. Um, uh, I'll, I'll skip the next point, why bank capital has, has formed with development, because it depends on a uh, on, on the specifics here. But, but uh, the, the broader point I want you to take away for, for regulation is that post-financial crisis, uh, where banks were levered too much, uh, you can think of them as having played that to the hilt. 
and, and there was a huge amount of leverage embedded in the banks. With, and it wasn't just through demand deposits. Here I, I'm talking about demand deposits, but a lot of the time banks get into trouble is by borrowing overnight in the, in the, uh, in the commercial paper markets. Uh, that would look very similar to dem demand deposits in this model. And, and so banks had levered tremendously pre-financial crisis. Leverage ratios for some banks was, was, were sometimes quoted at 50 and above, right? That's too much. And so it made sense post-financial crisis to ask banks to hold more capital. But one of the concerns bankers have been expressing, and of course bankers have no credibility because they've cried wolf too often, but one of the concerns they've been expressing is, look guys, you know, some capital is good, but if you keep asking us for more capital, eventually this is going to impinge on intermediation. It's, it is going to uh, create greater aversion to taking on uh, risky lending, and that's going to be a problem. I think we see some of that today. Uh, certainly, as an emerging market uh, central banker and regulator, I see that foreign banks have stopped opening branches because our credit rating is BAA. We're a, you know, investment grade country, which means that anything in the country is higher risk than BAA. We, and, and therefore, from the perspective of international banks that are asked to put in money in India, they say it's not worth it. We have to, we have to essentially set aside a lot more capital. Our situation is similar to the situation of small and medium enterprises in industrial countries. At a time when we require more growth, we have to ask ourselves, are we at the point where more capital is good? Or is it likely to impinge on the kinds of activities banks do? And I want to argue that there is a trade-off. We should not say there is absolutely no trade-off in this process. And uh, to some extent, this is a call for more empirical work as to what the right level of capital is. Bottom, bottom line, I have one minute left, is that there is a reason why banks are built the way they are. And all these proposals to do away with banks, to my mind, will impose serious costs on the system, that it will increase the cost of financing, and therefore we have to be very careful to essentially uh, argue for ruling out banks or for getting rid of banks. Uh, a finance company trying to do the same business will demand a much higher rate of return from uh, the borrower than, than banks do today. Uh, however, uh, we do understand the consequences of systemic crises. They are severe, they are painful. So more capital was warranted than what there was during the global financial crisis, but we have to be careful about going too far. What I want to do tomorrow is take this basic setup of a bank demand depositors and put it in a larger setting and ask the question, yes, these banks are prone to runs, yes, uh, uncertainty can precipitate these runs, and banks may not have enough capital to avert uh, runs in the worst, worst possible downturns. If so, is there a reason for the authorities to intervene? What is the form of intervention that makes sense? What form of intervention makes less sense? I'm specifically going to talk about monetary policy as a way of intervening and what costs that has to the system if not done properly. So that's tomorrow based on this basic model. Let me stop here. Thank you very much.